Okay, so how TDD changed my life. So let's start just by talking about what is TDD. Um, I've, I've given this talk a couple times. I like to talk about TDD, uh, but then I, I get done and, and someone goes, oh, I didn't even know what TDD was. I just kind of was intrigued by your title or, or something like that. So, so I start by, let's lay the groundwork before we get into how it changed my life just so we're all on the same page. So TDD stands for simply test-driven development. It is a way of writing software. It is not a library, it's not a tool, it's not a language. It's a, it's a way, it's an approach of writing software. So if you've heard of things like pair programming or mob programming, it's kind of like that. It's another approach, it's another tool that you can use while writing software. So you can do TDD in JavaScript and Ruby and .NET and Java and Elixir and just about any language that there is anymore. Uh, maybe some of the more obscure ones are going to be a little bit harder. Uh, but you can do TDD in just about any language. Um, TDD is uh, the way that you do it is you write the tests <coughs> first, or you write a test first. We'll get into a little bit more of how that works pragmatically here in a minute. But you write the test before you write the code, and you do that in a way that makes sure then that you always have tested code. Because you're writing a test and you're writing code, and they kind of they work like gears. So you don't ever write your code and then come back later and write your tests. So it works this way. You start by writing a failing test. Um, so if we're going to, just for the purpose of this example, we'll, we'll think about adding a, creating a calculator. So we might have an add method where we're going to add two numbers. Um, and so we might write a test where we expect 0 plus 1 to equal 1. And that test doesn't even compile if you're using a static language because the add function doesn't yet exist. Like, that's how serious I am about writing your test first. You don't even write the, the function yet. So you write it and you get this failing test. And the reason you do that is because now you have verified not only that your code is going to work when the test passes, but that your test is testing the thing you think it's testing. Um, and I have to say that it kind of slow a couple times because it takes a minute to adjust. If you write your test later, you might have a test pass for some unknown reason. But if you write a test that fails and then you write code that works and the test now passes, you know that the test is doing what you think it's doing. So that's actually the next step is that you write the simplest code to make it pass. So if we stick with our let's add 0 plus 1 and get 1, we might think, okay, well, the simplest code would be to like return A plus B, but that's not the simplest code. The simplest code would be to simply return the number 1, because that is the simplest thing that you can do to make that test pass. And if you're like me when you first heard that, you thought, well, that's dumb, because I know that 1 is not going to work for all of at. And you're right, it's not, right? You're smart people. You realize that 1 is not the answer of all summations. But it does make the test pass, and it minimizes your risk. So if you start trying to do more complicated stuff, uh, your tests get harder to write and harder to manage. And so then you would go back and you'd write the next test. And the next test might be something like, when I add 1 plus 1, I get 2. And so now, just simply returning 1 will pass the first test, but it's going to fail the second test. And if you change that to return 2, it's going to pass the second test, but fail the first test. And so now you have to write the simplest code that will make both tests pass, and that probably is A plus B. And then you write one more test where, you know, 1 plus 99 equals 100, and you realize that your, your function's already working, right? Because it's already passing. Your test didn't fail, um, and so you're kind of done at that point. You have two tests. Now, mathematicians in the room probably would have 100 tests on addition, um, but for our sake, we, we would just have two. So you're going to write the simplest code to make it pass. So those are the first two steps. Um, they call the first step red because the test in most testing frameworks is going to return a red line when the test fails and a green line when it passes. So it's red, green. And then the third step is refactor. Uh, and refactor is an actual step of TDD, so every few, every few test cycles you're supposed to stop and see, is there anything I can refactor? And this is in uh, distinction, or this is in contrast to how most of us write software, especially if you're doing sprints. If you're lucky, you might have a refactor sprint at the end of a milestone, so you might go months or quarters or years before the, B, the BA says, okay, let's have a refactor sprint or let's have a tech debt sprint, right? With TDD, you're going a few minutes before you start to refactor. So it's actually bringing in some of these best practices like refactoring your code and making sure it's readable while you're doing the tests. Um, so I'm on a project right now that, that runs um, quarter milestones. So they have sprints, two-week sprints throughout the, throughout the quarter. And then the final one is kind of a, a tech debt cleanup sprint. And, and so if you wait till that tech debt spr uh, cleanup sprint, mm -hmm. you're not going to get a lot of refactoring done because you only have two weeks and there's other things you have to do at that time. But if you're refactoring as you go, there's never an excuse for having a bad variable name or a function that's doing too much or something that isn't quite named right or an abstraction that isn't quite right because every you know, five, 10 minutes you have a chance to refactor again. So that's the basics of TDD, it's uh, red, green, refactor. So when you hear people talk about TDD or test-driven development, they'll often say that, red, green, refactor. And what they mean is write a failing test, write a passing test, and then refactor. 
And so you're really only supposed to refactor when all the tests are green. So if you have broken tests, you shouldn't be changing things because you don't know what's working and what's not. It's important to note as well that it's, we're not just talking about unit tests. You can write unit tests at any point in time in the development cycle. Right? You can write them, you could go write 100 unit tests before you write a single line of code. Uh, you could write a, all of your code, all of your feature, and then come back later and write your unit tests. But that's when neither of those are TDD. Um, and, and what you'll find as you get into TDD is that oftentimes when you do the latter, um, your, your code becomes hard to test because you're not thinking about testing while you're writing your code. And so you'll go, okay, we're going to write some unit tests, and you'll write some simple unit tests, and you'll get into something complex, and you'll stare at the screen for a couple hours, and you're like, yeah, maybe it's just not worth it to test it, and we'll move on, right? So that's one outcome. Another outcome that I've seen time and time and time again is uh, if you're in stand-up, so if you're doing agile and you're doing some kind of daily, here's what I did yesterday, um, someone will go, okay, well, the feature's done, I just have to write tests, right? That's a common thing. Some of you have probably said it. I think I've said it at some point in time. Um, and what happens then is the product owner or the BA, or whoever's running that, says, well, we're kind of in a tight deadline. Could you just go ahead and push the feature up and we'll get the test later, right? And that happens a lot. Uh, and then later never comes, right? It's, it's, that, it's that perpetual lie, like, oh, next week we'll write the test, next week we'll write the test. So that's a distinction between unit tests and TDD, and I want to make sure that distinction is clear as well, because what, the benefits that we're going to talk about and how TDD really did change my development life and ultimately my, my, my actual life um, is not from unit tests, but actually from the practice of test-driven development. One of the important key takeaways of, of TDD is that testing is not a separate process. Like we just said, you can sometimes write your tests after and then the BA say, hey, can we push those later? When you're doing TDD, you write that failing test and then you write the code that makes it pass and then you write your next failing test and then code to make it pass and the next failing test and the code to make it pass and they're, they're like this gear, right? They're joined together or maybe even better like a zipper uh, because the gear is eventually going to rotate out but they're like a zipper and they're holding each other fast. Uh, and so when I say, uh, as someone who's doing uh, TDD, when I say my feature's done, I mean that the feature works in the browser, and it has code coverage, and it's tested, and the tests are all passing. That's what I mean when I say it's done. So I, I don't have, I have a built-in um, resource to push back on my BA uh, when he or she says, can we push this later, or can we do the test later? No, because my feature won't be done until my tests are done, right? And so it's kind of that built-in way of, of, of checking ourselves. And when I first started this, it was much, it, it was for, um, I was a lone developer and I needed some way to kind of check myself. And the more I've done it now, the more I realize, or the more I've come to believe anyway, that TDD is a, is a professional responsibility of software developers because now I am preventing my VA uh, with all their good intentions from pushing out untested code, right? And that's something that's important for us because if we want to, if we want to claim to be professionals, and I have a whole other talk that unfortunately isn't here today, but a whole other talk about professionalism and how we can't be responsible, we can't be responsible people for pushing out bad code because we can impact people's lives uh, with, with data loss, identity theft, I mean ultimately even death. Um, uh, the Toyota uh, acceleration cases a few years ago were because of bad code, untested code, untestable code uh, with 10,000 global variables in an engine control module, like that's just bad code. So I have some built-in resources to prevent me from doing that and it's called test-driven development and I can push back on the BA and go, no, we can't release the feature because the feature isn't done, because my tests aren't done. So right now, like maybe you can type in the first name and you can hit submit and that's as far as you get uh, because I haven't written the rest of the test so I don't have the rest of the feature. This also is important to note that this happens many times a minute. So when I'm talking about this red-green refactor cycle, I'm not talking about I might do three of these a day. I might do 10 of these a minute. Um, because I'm going to write a simple test, I'm going to see it fail, I'm going to write the, the, the passing code to make it, or the code to make it pass, and then I'm going to do the same thing again and again and again. And so in my setup, um, I, I like to just have one big widescreen monitor, but some of you guys like to have two or three monitors. And so I used, to, I used to do that. When I did that, I had a monitor that all it did was have my test runner up on the monitor. And so I could be sitting here staring at my monitor and in my peripheral, I could see whether anything was red or green. So I'd make a change, oh, something went red, oh, let me go check it out, right? And so I can do this many times a minute. And if you're not doing it many times a minute, you're not going to get some of the benefits that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. Um, it only happens when you do this repeatedly and continuously. That's where these benefits come in. So we're going to look at three big categories of, of change, ways that it changed my life. The first, the first big category, probably the most obvious, is code. And the first problem that it helped me address was the code breaking code, or what I call the, the problem of the Looney Tune Hotel. Uh, so growing up, I liked watching Looney Tunes, and there was one um, that, that had uh, Elmer Fudd checking into a hotel after a long journey. He was tired. Uh, and he just wanted to go to bed. That's all he wanted. And, and Daffy Duck is the, the, is the front desk uh, clerk. And Elmer Fudd goes up, 
and they had those old vacuum tubes in the hotel so you could send things into the room. And Dappy uh, puts a, um, a mouse in the tube and shoots it up to Elmer's room. And so Elmer's in his room and this mouse pops out of the wall and starts making all, all kinds of mouse noises. And Elmer can't sleep because this mouse is over here squeaking and running around and everything. So he calls down to the front desk and he says, there's a mouse in my room, can you do something about it? And Dappy says, absolutely, we'll send up a cat. So they send up a cat, and, and Elmer is relieved because he knows that the cat is going to either take care of the mouse or at least get it out of the room. Uh, and so the cat does, and then Elmer goes in and like brushes his teeth, and he comes out of the bathroom, and the cat's laying on the bed with a paw on each corner of the bed, taking up the whole thing. And Elmer, Elmer is pushing on him, and the cat's moving, but not letting Elmer get on the bed. And all Elmer wants to do is go to sleep. So he calls down to the desk again, and he says, uh, now, now there's a cat problem. And Daffy says, absolutely, sir, we'll send up a dog. Uh, so they send up a dog, the dog chases out the cat, but true Looney Tune forms, the dog's a boxer, so all it's going to do is punch Elmer the entire time. Uh, and obviously if you're getting punched in the head or anywhere else, you're not going to fall asleep anytime soon. Uh, and so he gets back on the phone and says, uh, now there's a dog, and there's a dog problem. Oh yeah, absolutely sir, we'll take care of that. So they send up a lion. And the lion does take care of the dog, but of course there's all sorts of problems with lions. Um, uh, and they're big and noisy and all this kind of stuff. And so eventually this, this continues until the, the, the animal that they send up is an elephant, I think, to scare away the lion, but there might have been some other animals in between. And it works. The, the, the lion's gone, but an elephant's pretty big, right? And it takes up the entire room, and Elmer can't even get to his bed, much less go to bed. So he calls down to the desk one more time, and Daff, uh, Daffy says, absolutely, sir. And he sends up the mouse to scare away the elephant, and the whole thing starts over again, right? Um, and so that's the whole, like, 15-second or 15-minute uh, uh, cartoon there. And I have had that problem in my code. Um, I was working on a quoting system uh, for some electrification uh, pieces uh, for a company that built electrification systems. And there was two product lines. One was called SafeLec2 and one was called 8Bar. And from the back of the room, those probably look pretty similar. They're orange and green and they have some collector shoes. But the difference was, was the profile of the bar. Um, and both of these were proprietary products that they owned. Um, and these would be things like um, uh, people movers in airports. Uh, would get electrification. Uh, a lot of the rides at carnivals will have uh, uh, in the middle, like especially like merry-go-rounds that spin around, they'll have collect, they'll have conductor bar on the inside, they'll have collector shoes on the outside that power the thing. So this was kind of the stuff that, that this system or this company sold. And my job was to write a quoting application that our customers could call in and say, hey, I need some, I need some uh, conductor bar. And our salespeople would walk them through a series of steps and they would give them a bill of materials at the end. And they would say, you need a thousand meters of this kind of bar and these kind of collector shoes and all this kind of stuff. And so I wrote the SafeLec 2 one because it was the most popular version, or the most popular product that we sold. So I wrote that first and I sent it to our QA person and she tested it. And she said, yeah, the, the bill of materials looks good. You've got the right number of parts, the right prices, blah, 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 blah. Everything's good. So then I went back and wrote the 8-bar, and she tests the 8-bar, and she's like, well, the 8-bar looks good, but I got some bad news. The Safe Like 2-bar is now giving you one piece too many, uh, and we don't want to do that because then our customers complain we've got to take the return and all this kind of junk, right? Oh, okay, yeah, I'll solve that. So I go and I solve the Safe Like 2 piece, not giving us, uh, we make sure it gives us the right amount, and I send it back to QA, and she says, yeah, now Safe Like 2 works, but now there's this problem with 8-bar. Right? And so it was one of these things where I just kept like that whack-a-mole game. I kept smacking different bugs down and new ones kept popping up. And if I was smart, I mean, I was probably a junior or mid-level developer at this point. If I was smart, I would have realized that like there's some fundamental problems with my, my architecture at this point if these two distinct things are influencing each other that much. But I wasn't smart. And so I just got more and more frustrated. And, and I was like, there's got to be, uh, there has to be a better way of solving this kind of problem, right? We, this can't be something that all the developers just continue to live with. Because if it is, I'm going to get out of the development industry. So the better way is that my test would instantly break. If I, if I were to write this with TDD, then when I made a change to SafeLec that broke something on 8-bar, I wouldn't have to... Uh, make the change, check it in, push it to source control, have cruisecontrol.net, pull it down, build it, build the MSI package, push it out to a network share, email the QA person, tell her to download it, wait an hour for her to download, install a half an hour to test, and two and a half hours later I find out there's a bug, which is what my, my process was on a good day. Right? She, if she had other things, we're talking maybe the next day I find out there's a bug. And I've already moved on, I've written more code. With tests, with TDD, I would instantly see my, my test go from red to green, and I would, I would have to stop and go, okay, Something broke. Let me go look at why. It would force me back into my code and it would force me to look at what I just wrote and is there a better way to handle that? Is there a cleaner way to handle that? Is there a way to keep 8-bar and SafeLec separate so that they're not stomping in on each other's toes? Uh, but I didn't have that. So I had this two and a half, three hour, half day, full day QA process uh, that was not a good uh, feedback loop. 
right? I mean, one of the reasons I think most of us like development is we have an instant feedback loop. We can make a change, we can refresh the browser, we can refresh the app, and it's there. Uh, but when you're, when you're doing this kind of thing, uh, where you're pushing it out, waiting for somebody else to, to check all of the things, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a good feedback loop. So my test would instantly break, and that's the first way that TDD would help me. Uh, the second type of coding problem that caused me no end of frustration was hard to reproduce bugs. So on the same application, I got this exact exception um, in, in, on March 4th of 2010. Uh, so we're talking seven years ago. And I still remember it because that's how much frustration it caused. So it was for internal salespeople. And so some of my internal salespeople would come in the, in the morning. Uh, they would open up the quoting application. They'd do a quote. They'd close it down. They'd go do something else. They'd come back in the day. They'd open it up. They'd do a quote. They'd close it down. And that was great. Uh, those, those were my best users because I never had problems with them. Then I had other people that liked to come in in the morning at 8 a.m. They opened every possible application that they might want that day, and they closed it down at 5 o'clock that day when they went home. And for the first seven hours of the day, six and a half hours of the day, everything worked fine. And then sometime around uh, almost 3 o'clock there, so 2.50, uh, you get this exception. And it was only on the people that had it open all day. And so it took me, it probably took me a while to figure out that it was only on the people that had it open all day uh, because that was kind of like user interviews, like what are you doing to get this error? And like any good mid-level developer, what I did was I went back to the source code and I added about a million log statements so that I could see what was going on uh, at that time so I could catch the exception and log out as much as humanly possible. And I released a new version. I said, here, try this. And the guy tried it the next day and of course it crashed at 2.50 or 3 o'clock the next day. And he's like, great, what happened? I'm like, I don't know, I gotta go read the logs. So I'd go read the logs, and I'd find out that, okay, I got close, but I didn't log enough stuff. So now I need to drill it out into this module, let's repeat the process the next day, right? This bug took me at least a week uh, to solve, um, and one of the reasons I remember it was, it was one of the first blog posts I ever wrote, because I was like, I, I am going to capture this thing so I don't ever forget about it. It was a two-part blog post back in 2010, and it was one of the first ones I, I wrote. And so, it's just very frustrating, right? It's a timeout. So like the best possible case for a timeout is you let the thing run on a system for eight hours or seven hours until the exception happens. But it wasn't just that it was sitting there. It wasn't a memory leak where it just was sitting there and eating up more and more memory until the thing crashed. It was only when they were doing things, like only when they were issuing quotes did this timeout actually happen. And so I couldn't just fire it up on my computer and let it run. Um, and so what became more and more frustrating was trying to diagnose this problem. And eventually we got it solved and it worked, uh, like I said, a week or two later. But I left that problem thinking, again, there's got to be a better way of dealing with timeout bugs than what I'm dealing with. And so how TDD makes it better is that it makes it easier to force errors. So once I get this exception, I, I logged that exception right away because I, I had my software set up to log all exceptions to a file so I could catch them. So I knew the exception existed. And I even knew from the stack trace where it existed. But I didn't know why it existed. I didn't know how it got into that state. But with a test, I could force that, right? I could go in and I could, with surgical precision, could say, when you get to line 13, throw this exception. And then in my test environment, in my, in my TDD uh, setup, I could have that test running constantly. And then I could go, okay, well, when I get this exception, what I need to do is I need to, uh, I need to close down the web connection, because uh, if you notice, it was a HTTP connection to our intranet. So I need to close that down. I probably need to recycle it. Um, it's probably a connection pool issue, right? And I could try those things. I could try them very quickly, because again, I'm doing multiple times a minute. So I could run this thing and I could say, okay, let's make sure that the connection pool is reset and let's make sure the connection's closed down and all the resources are cleaned up and yada, yada, yada. I could do it with surgical precision. So there are no more really difficult to recreate bugs when you're doing TED because you have control of each line of your code. You have access to it. You can set up the state however you want, even if it's a state that should never happen, or even if it's a state that should happen once in a, a million runs, right? Like you can still control that. Uh, and it's a lot harder to do when you're going through the application. So that's the second way that TDD made my code better and made my coding life better. Uh, the third one was that I was afraid to make changes. How many people have seen this code? Um, it's got, what, three lines, there's an ellipsis there. There's actually more to this code. Um, this was not verbatim, but this basically was from a admin tool that I worked on for a public-facing website um, that sold uh, sales information. Um, but it actually gets better. Um, uh, how many, do we have any .NET developers? A few, okay, a lot. So there's some things here like um, uh, date time is a nullable date time. Um, ints are nullable for some reason. Uh, there's a nullable Boolean because what we really want is true, false, or null. Um, uh, and so it actually gets better because the follow-up code in the controller then spent like the first 50 lines doing a bunch of null checks. 
And I wanted to bang my head against the desk because I was like, well, if you didn't make them nullable in the first place, you wouldn't get into this condition, right? But, but then at the same time, I'm questioning myself because I'm like, well, maybe there's some other situation that I'm not aware of. So I don't want to go change those to non-nullables and delete these exceptions because I don't know what that's going to do. This was a 250-line controller method with a, with a five-line method signature. Like, I'm not touching this thing, right? Like, I'm afraid to abstract, abstract, extract out a function because I don't know what this thing's doing. I can't, I can't prove what this thing's doing. There's no tests around it. The person that wrote it um, just started coding. And, and honestly, probably what happened was they probably started with like update user and you gave them like a start date, an end date, and a user ID. And that was probably it, right? Because this is how development works. It started with three parameters. And then the next person came and they're like, well, it's only one more. And then it's only one more. It's only one more. It's only one more. And then eventually it was like, yeah, I know it's like five more now, but this function's already doing so much that I don't know what else it's doing, so I better just continue the pattern. Right? And so the pattern's already been set. We're going to just keep following the pattern because we don't, want to, we don't want to get the wrath of the senior developers telling us that we're breaking a pattern, even if the pattern's bad. And so here we are debugging all of this and like, I need to make a change. I need to, I need to make some logic changes in this code and I am scared to death because the only way to do this, make the change, push it to our dev server, log in, and run through like a million test cases in the browser that I can think of. Like what happens if I update the start date? What happens if I update their username? What happens if I update this? What happens if I update that? Or just make the change, which is what happens way too much. Just make the change, push it, cross our fingers that you know, the users will catch the bugs, right? Which is again, not a good approach. So again, it's, it's another one of those where there has to be a better way of solving this kind of problem. Um, I have never done that with spaghetti sauce. I don't know what this infomercial is trying to sell. Um, but it's not a problem I have. So code with TDD, you now have built-in code coverage to extract your code. And this is honestly one of the things that most, uh, most people that don't do test-driven development think this is the number one benefit of test-driven development, and I would disagree. But it is, a good, it is a good benefit. Most people think, well, you're gonna write a bunch of tests so you have a bunch of coverage so that you can abstract a lot of stuff. And it, it's a good advantage. I don't think it's the best one. I think lots of these are, are better. Um, but what you now have is if you're writing your code uh, in a TDD style, you have a built-in test suite. And so if you change a Boolean from false to true accidentally in the code, you're gonna have some broken tests. Or if I go add some logic to update that user's start date in some new special case, like if they're uh, a user type of seven, then update their start date to this, that will break any tests in which that case should not happen. So I no longer have to cross my fingers. I no longer have to uh, go through this big long release cycle uh, before I figure out what's going on. And further, I can now start breaking out chunks. Um, we had a, a, a younger developer at work the other day, uh, it's been a month or two now, that he'd written, he had some tested code, it was covered, it was good. And he's like, can you help me refactor this? And so I came over and I was like, well, we can, we can abstract, extract this line into its own function. We can extract these five lines into their own functions. We can extract this into its own function. And at the end, we had a much cleaner, like, seven-line function that read exactly like what it was doing. It went and fetched the users, it updated the user, it saved the user, it did something else. Um, whereas before, he had that maybe in several for loops or something like that. It was very hard to read. But because we had code coverage, we could clean up our code. Um, and so it no longer becomes a, like, yeah, I wish I could write clean code. It's now you have the power to write clean code because you can extract your code. So there's another problem that I had as well. There was too many changes. Um, so this is kind of how I felt often uh, when writing software. I felt like the camel in which, you know, it, it kind of goes back to that, well, it started with one parameter and I wound up with 20 because I just kept, you know, adding another piece. So I was working on a, a different, um, it was a, a sales reporting scorecard for salespeople. Um, and, and it started simply enough. Um, they wanted to know the sales by salesmen per month so they could rank them. Um, and they could say, okay, Bob did the most sales and then, and then Jane did the second most or whatever. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's pretty easy. We have all the data, that's not a problem. Um, and then they said, great, uh, now that you've got that, can you roll it up by region? So there's the southeast region and the northwest region and the midwest region. Like, okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. Like, we know what region they're in. And we did that, and they're like, great. Um, can you roll up the region by quarter? Because we, we sometimes want to give quarterly bonuses and not just year-end rankings. And so we went back and rolled up uh, by quarter. And then they said, oh, uh, did we forget to tell you that some sales uh, have warranties and we want to count those as well? And so it was kind of at this point that we realized like this, this, uh, this popsicle architecture that we were working on wasn't going to hold up much longer. Um, but it was one of those things where it was like we trusted, and this was our mistake, we trusted the people telling us the requirements that they knew all the requirements up front. And that's not a knock on them, it's, it's just how software happens. We, we never know all the requirements up front, right? And, and once we start giving them software, they start seeing cool options, and that's part of the power of software is we're like able to solve real problems. And they go, well, if you can solve that, you can solve this, right? And so what happened was we had this big ball of mud 
that was, again, it, it became one of those like functions that was, I don't know, 150, 200 lines just to give some ratings, just to do some sorting, really. Uh, and it was very frustrating to work because it had all these other problems that we had as well. I was afraid to change. I had the Looney Tunes problem uh, where I would make a change on the quarterlies and it would impact uh, the individuals. Uh, and it was just, it was just a pain. Uh, and so this is actually the project that kind of kicked me in the butt and made me actually start doing TDD. I went home one weekend, pulled the code locally, um, and started a brand new project. And I said, what would this look like if I did test-driven development? Because this is like the perfect example. It's just math. It's just doing calculations. There's no real, like once I get the data, there's no more database access. I have a bunch of data I just need to operate on. And so I, I worked for, I don't know, half a day or something like that. And I pushed up the repository, I pushed up a different repository so that my coworkers could look at it. And it was much cleaner. We actually suddenly had a metric class and we had a, a, a quarter class and we had all these different kind of classes that knew how to do their calculations instead of this one big function that was trying to know how to do everyone's calculations. So now we're getting into some of the solid principles, right? The separation of concerns are now into individual C-sharp classes instead of one big monolithic function. Uh, and so this is how often I find software often happens, right? Is that we, we get a lot of these individual requirements, piecemeal requirements. And, and if you're not careful, you're going to apparently spray toothpaste all over the place, which again isn't a problem I've had. My, even with teenagers, my sink never looks that bad. So I don't know what this infomercial is trying to sell either. But this gives you, TDD gives you pause to look at your code. Um, and I, I have to be careful about using the word pause. I, I like to say it slows you down, but then all the managers that are in my, in my talks, they, they get all freaked out. Like, what do you mean you're gonna write code slower? Um, because, because we're really not, but it gives you pause. You've got that red, green refactor cycle. So you've written your failing test, you've written your passing test, and now you can pause for a minute and go, is there anything I need to refactor? Is this the best organization of the code or is there a better way to do it? Um, and so that gives you that chance to slow down and go, you know what, this would make a better class. I've already got all my tests, why don't I just pull this out into another class, run my tests, they still pass, good, let's keep going. Right? Or, oh shoot, something broke, oh yeah, I forgot to copy over this function, let me copy that over as well, now all my tests pass, let's keep going. And so this is the kind of benefit that TDD gets you, it gives you that chance to, to slow down and take a breath. Now I'm not telling you to sit and stare at your monitor for hours at a time and not write code and not deliver things, but if we just keep up this frantic pace of sprinting, 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 uh, we get into problems. Um, one, of the, one of my um, frustrations right now is on one of, my, one of my projects ends their sprints, their agile sprints on Wednesdays, and they start their new sprints on Thursday, and so I have no break. I finish a sprint, I start a sprint. I finish a sprint, I start a sprint, right? There's never that pause where if I at least finish on a Friday, I get that pause of like, okay, I'm gonna take the weekend, kind of decompress, figure out what I'm gonna do Monday. And a lot of the times we write our code that way too, right? Oh, I got this feature done, great, let me grab another one and go. Right? And, and when we get, that's when we get into this, where we would do that and we wouldn't even realize, um, you know, we would grab this feature and get done, then grab this one and grab this one. And by the time we got down here somewhere where they kept adding features, we're like, oh no, uh, we're in a world of hurt. Because now what we have to do is we have to go to our boss and, and ask for a month to rewrite the calculation part. And I've never had my boss say, yeah, why don't you take a month to rewrite the calculation part, right? Because we just keep adding pieces to it. So when we can slow down and just take a pause, just a, a deep breath, really is all it is, uh, that helps us to, to focus on the code and helps us to see is there a better way to clean up the code. So those are all code related things and those are all important because that's what we do, we write, we, we write software and so it's important that test driven development helps us write software better. Um, but there's also other, I mean we're also humans, we're not just coding machines, we're not just coding monkeys despite what recruiters try to sell us as, uh, we're also humans and so it helps that we are productive, it helps our own psyche, it helps our own um, just how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about our code if we're productive. So we're going to look at the second area that TDD changed my life was in the area of productivity. So how many people do nothing? So Monday morning you're going to go into work at let's say 8 o'clock and you're going to leave at say 5 o'clock and you're going to do nothing but work in the IDE that day. Nobody. I've never, I don't think I've ever had anyone actually raise their hand, right? Because there's always email, there's always Slack, there's always stand up, there's always, uh, you know, your coworker stopping by. Right? And those kind of things cause distractions. And so what I started encountering was I might have a coworker stop by and ask a, a, a genuine uh, question for five minutes that they really need help on. And, and for whatever reason, I'm the only one that can answer them. And so I answer them that question. Um, but then when they leave, I have to stop and think, what was I doing when they came over? Especially now, um, now that we use Git, um, we, I've been using Git for several years, but I might go check out their branch. 
and I might have their branch and I might have built their version of the site. And so when I'm looking at the browser, it doesn't look like my version because I'm looking at their feature, I'm looking at the IDE, my code's not there. And I'm, oh, what branch was I on? Oh yeah, there's the branch I was on. Okay, well now, now that I know what branch I was on, what was I doing? Like there's all these kind of problems from a five minute coworker conversation, right? <laughs> it gets a little worse when I go to lunch. Um, I like to leave the office for lunch as much as possible, not because I don't like what I do, but it just gives me that nice break of being outside or being somewhere else. And so I'll be gone for an hour or, or maybe I'll go to the gym over lunch and so I might be gone for an hour and a half. And when I come back, I have to stop and think, what was I doing? It's been an hour and a half. And despite the fact that everyone in this room is super bright and super intelligent, we have the memory of goldfish when we come back from lunch, we're like, I don't remember what I was doing. What was the feature I was working on? What was the step I was gonna do next? It gets a little worse when I go to a meeting, um, not because necessarily meetings are longer, but they sure feel like it a lot of times, right? Like it, it feels like, oh, I've been in this meeting for three hours, and you're like, nope, it's been 15 minutes, right? Um, especially when you get into those arguments over like what you should call this feature, or how you should architect the feature, and I've checked out a long time ago. And so when I get back from a meeting, I, I think, oh, I don't know where I was. And then it gets even worse when I go home on a Friday and I come back on Monday. So you guys are at a conference, those of you who are here yesterday or even Wednesday, you're going to come back to the office on Monday and you're going to be three, two or three days away from what you were doing or actually five days away um, because of the weekend. Um, so my company uh, recently sent uh, everyone to Cabo as a company retreat and, and I didn't go for various reasons. Uh, I wanted to stay home, we didn't have anyone to watch the kids and I, I loved it. I got to stay at work and work the entire time, nobody bugged me, it was awesome. Um, but then when they came back, I was gone. I was there for a Monday. I was gone. I was there Wednesday, and then I was gone for a conference. And I, I came back the next week, and I was like, I don't know how these people went to Cabo, because I was gone. I worked for a Monday. I took off Tuesday to go uh, do a training, and when I came back Wednesday, I'd already forgotten what I'd done Monday. I just had five solid days of not interrupted work, followed by a weekend, followed by a day of good work, and on the next day, I couldn't remember what I was doing. Um, and, and so when I go home, that becomes a problem. And so you start thinking, okay, well, maybe there isn't a better way to solve this. Maybe this is just a problem that we have. Here the problem is you need to learn how to use a drill. Um, <laughs> amen from the back. Uh, so tests are going to start leaving a breadcrumb. So one of the things that I figured out early on in that project where I was talking about quoting software, or not quoting software, the, the, the salesperson software, one of the things that I figured out early on, and it wasn't me, I think I read it from a blog post, is the idea of why don't I stop with a failing test? Because then when I come back on after lunch or I come back the next day, I have a red test and it tells me exactly what I was doing. And all I have to do is solve that red test. And that gets me right back into the flow. And what I found was when I leave with a red test, I'm much less likely to come back and check email first thing in the morning. I'm much less likely to get on Reddit in the morning. I'm much less likely to check Twitter or Slack or anything else. I'm much more likely to like, this red test is bugging me, let me go solve it. In fact, so much so that the first time I tried this, I was supposed to be home at 5.30 and I was leaving at 5.00. And I left with a red test and I left it and I was like, oh, but I know how to solve that. And so I solved it really quick. And then I kicked myself. I was like, oh, I was supposed to leave with a red test. So I wrote it the next step. That was the next failing test. And, and I was like, oh, I know how to solve that one. And so I solved it. And I was like, oh, I was supposed to leave with a red test. And I worked until I actually wound up home late because I was sitting here writing tests and solving tests and writing tests and solving tests because it was addictive. I couldn't stop it until I finally made myself like, my wife's going to kill me if I don't get home right now. Um, and so it leaves that trail of breadcrumbs where I no longer have to wonder, what was I doing? Now, when I go back to work on Monday, I do have this problem because I finished a feature um, when, uh, Tuesday night right before I left and I sent it off, so I'm going to start a brand new feature, which means I probably won't be productive at all on Monday. I'll probably have like a hundred and some emails I'll have to check. But when I leave Monday, what I'll try to do is leave with a failing test, which will get me back into the groove on Tuesday. The second productivity thing was I didn't know what I did. And I don't mean like right now, I don't know what I just did on a feature. I mean, what did I do today? So this was me every day when I went home, when I was working on that quoting software. Um, and it got to the point, um, so my wife was way more perceptive than I was. She told me that I needed to leave that job a year before I finally realized that she was right and left the job. Um, and, and it was, because I was coming home grouchy every day. She's like, oh, you don't like your job. And I would bark at her, oh, I do like my job. What makes you think I don't like my job, right? <laughs> and, and looking back, right, you can laugh, but like in the moment, I was like, you are so wrong. You don't know that I like my job, right? But this was me, I was grouchy, because part of it, I contribute to the fact that I might work for eight hours of the day, and when I left, I have no, no sense of accomplishment. I might not have fixed the bug. I might not have got the feature done. I might not have not gotten anything really moved forward. I just worked for eight hours a day. I went in and worked for the man for eight hours a day. I sat in the cube for eight hours a day, and I stared at my monitor for eight hours a day, and I had nothing to show for it, right? And so I started thinking, okay, well, there has to be a better way, or I have to leave the industry, because I can't do this for another 30-some years. <clears throat> the way 
that is better, the way that TDD helped me, was that tests test tell me what I did that day. So if I'm writing test driven, if I'm doing test driven development, and I'm writing, you know, let's say 10 tests a minute or even five tests a minute, um, then at the end of an hour, I might have 300 to 600 tests. Now that's, that's probably like, if that's all I get to do is write tests, then that's true. In, in reality, I don't write that many tests in an hour, but I write a lot. And so at the end of a day, even on a day where I might only write, you know, four hours of code and then I spend time in meetings and one-on-ones and stuff like that, um, I still get several hundred tests written, or at least I see the progress of tests, even if I'm not writing hundreds of tests. Uh, and so I can go back and I can open up uh, Git diff and I can see at the start of the day I had this many tests and now I have this many tests. And so there's that kind of sense of accomplishment. But in honesty, I don't actually ever go open up the diff and look at how many tests I wrote because I don't, I don't really care how many tests I wrote uh, at the end of the day. But what I do know is that I get this sense of accomplishment because every few seconds my brain is getting a release, release of endorphins because I just crossed something off a to-do list. Right? So I just went and said, okay, the next thing I need to do is uh, when the exception is thrown, I need to catch it. And so then I wrote a test that caught the exception and my brain goes, good job, you did that. Right? And then I go, okay, well now that I've caught the exception, I need to reset the connection pool. And my, I go do it and my brain goes, good job, you did another thing. Right? And it sounds really dumb because again, we're really smart and we don't want to think that we're, we're tricked by our brains, but we are. And so when you start having these tests pile up, your brain is just constantly releasing these endorphins of like, you did a good thing today. And so I leave at the end of the day not being Oscar the Grouch and not even necessarily knowing what I did, but knowing that I did something because my brain is telling me I did something. I moved the product forward. I got more of a feature written. I got some test, covered, uh, test coverage done. I've got some refactoring done. Uh, the next thing was a long, long feedback loop. This is an area of productivity as well. So I started my career. I, started, I have a degree in electrical engineering. I went to Caterpillar. Uh, and what they did was you rotated for the first year as a college graduate. So I spent four months in their core hardware group, which builds the ECMs, the electronic control modules, of every piece of Caterpillar equipment that comes off the factory line has at least one ECM on it, whether it's the little tiny uh, skid steer loader, a.k.a. Bobcats, or the, the giant mining trucks that have to be assembled on site because they're too big to sh be shipped. Um, fun fact, those big giant mining trucks, this might be a little scary if you're going to fly anytime soon, uh, those have more onboard computers than a 747. So um, the people mining actually have more uh, technological knowledge. At least this was the case in 2004. Maybe 747s have more now, but I kind of doubt it. So anyway, I was working in the core hardware group because I wanted to be an electrical engineer and, and I wanted to design circuits. And they came in and they said, okay, Nate, um, we've got this uh, problem where one of our circuits is consuming a little too much power. And this isn't the actual circuit, but we think it's this transistor here. And so what we want you to do is we want you to adjust some of these resistors. Uh, maybe we can't adjust the voltage supply, but adjust this, adjust this, uh, and run some simulations and see if we can reduce that power so that you can tell us what we need to change the circuit to. So I set off and did this, and, and I, I, I would change the circuit. I'd tweak a value on this uh, transistor, and I would run a piece by simulation. The piece by simulation took four hours. So I'd come in in the morning, I'd make one change, I'd run the simulation, I'd go to lunch, I'd come back from lunch, and the, piece, the simulation was done. And in my um, awesome abilities as an engineer, the piece by simulation always told me I didn't make a good enough change. And so I'd have to do another one. So I kicked that off and, and it would lock up my computer because this is in 2000, 2001. We had, you know, blazing fast single core, like 700 megahertz computers. Um, and, and I would just kick this thing off. It would lock it up and I'd go home at the end of the day and I'd come back in the morning and I'd see that the value was once again wrong. And so I did this for four months. And, and I'm sure I did other things. But the only thing I remember from these four months is this painful process of a very slow feedback loop. I left that group um, and moved on to the next one for my rotation and I decided I'm not going to do core hardware for sure. I think maybe software is where I want to be because I can get that quick feedback loop. And so I went into software and it was great because it went from a four hour uh, piece by simulation to worst case a 45 minute rebuild, um, which was actually perfect because that, those didn't happen all that often. When it was 45 minutes, it gave me a chance to go to the break room and grab a Coke and hit the bathroom and do some other things, all the while knowing that when I get back, I'll have five minutes before the build's done. But then I got into this problem later in my career in which I was deep into a website. And in fact, this even happened last week. Um, so I was working on some styling, which I am horrible at. Um, there's not anyone in this room worse at CSS than I am. But yet I got a feature that had to, or I got a story that had to make some CSS changes. Uh, and so it was deep in a wizard. It's like step four of a wizard. And so there's no way to, well, there's no way to TDD CSS. Uh, and, and there's really not a good way to jump to a page four of a wizard, at least not in this application. So what I got to do was I got to make some changes to the HTML and CSS. Refresh the application, create a new user, click the next button, pick a family plan, select it, pick some options, go to the next page, and hover. And hope that that pop-up worked. 
and hope that that pop-up looked good. And it didn't. And so I would do the whole thing over and over and over again, right? For days. Uh, days at this, right? And it was one of those things where everybody's busy and I'd get little bits and pieces of CSS help as I could, you know, as they're running between meetings or whatever. Um, and, and it was so frustrating. Because it was like, if this was just a logic problem, I'd have this thing solved already because I could write it with TDD, right? And so I, I, with both the piece by simulation and deep inside of a website where you might have to log in and drill down and select and move and all this kind of stuff till you get to page seven, you have this very long feedback cycle. And again, it's one of those things where you're, as a software developer, you're thinking there's got to be a better way. Well, the better way with testing is that you complete the loop multiple times a minute. And so, like I said, if it was a logic problem, that, that problem would have been solved, you know, an hour, worst case. But instead, it took probably a couple days. No, I didn't, that's not 16 hours, because I had meetings and other interruptions, but it took a couple days of me clicking through this wizard until I finally got all the CSS to line up perfectly and all the icons were there right and rendered on all the browsers correctly and all that good fun stuff, right? Um, and so, the, as much as I possibly can, if I can use TDD in its quick feedback loop, then I can enjoy my job better. And there's still gonna be times where I have to manipulate CSS on page four of a wizard, and I'm just gonna have to suck up and deal with it and realize that when I get back to writing uh, TDD, I'm going to enjoy that part a little bit more. Uh, the next thing was joining a project midstream. So in 2013, um, I uh, was at a small company, uh, six or seven of us, and they decided to close down. And so I, I went to where I'm at now, and we joined a team that was doing a prototype for a government application, and they were midway through their project. It was one of the few times that I'd started a midstream. Oftentimes, I was just fortunate enough to start at the beginning of a project. And, and I would get into this situation where I'd go, well, I don't know what this code does. I don't know what this particular code does. I know what the application does that we're writing, but I don't know what this module does. So one of the things I had to do was um, write some uh, timeline uh, code that would show the weather. So it would show like, oh, it's gonna be thunderstorms now, um, so that's bad weather. Oh, and at three o'clock today, it's green because it's clear, right? And so I'd have to figure out like, well, I don't know exactly how this code's doing, uh, or what it's doing, rather. And, and two of us started from the same company, the same day, one of my friends, and he sat next to me. And what I found, because I was doing TDD, was that I actually got my features done a little bit faster because I was able to figure out what the code was doing. So rather than trying to open those stupid clamshell things, um, there's, a, there's a better way, right? And that is, you get to deal with specific blocks of code. So much like with the exception, when I could inject an exception, or I could force an exception, I could write a test that exercises this block of code. And I don't have to go through the application and put a million breakpoints, right? How many, how many people know the breakpoint key in your IDE? A few of us, right? How many know like step next, step over, step into, the shortcuts, right? Like, that was me. I don't anymore. Because, I, because I'm able to write tests. And that's not, that's not an indictment if you do, but it, it, what it is is what I found was I would, I would, when I came to a problem, I'd open up my IDE, I'd put like a million breakpoints, and I'd start hitting them until I figured out, okay, I don't need those breakpoints, okay, I don't need those breakpoints, okay, this is the breakpoint I care about. But with tests, what I'm able to do is like, I know I need to exercise this block of code, but I don't know what this block of code does. Let me write a test that calls into this module or calls into this class and ex executes this line of code. And then if I need to, I could put some breakpoints there or I could use some debugging statements to kind of spit out some of the, the state of the object right then. But I'm dealing with the, the, the internal part of the code that I need and not the entire application. So I'm able to now deal with specific blocks of code. So we've got the first challenge, uh, our first change was code, the second change was productivity. Uh, and the third change that, that I didn't even realize for a while was confidence. So how many people are, I should have asked this earlier, how many people are doing like agile of some kind, scrum or Kanban or something where you have somewhat regular sprints or somewhat regular demos rather, right? How many people love going into the demo with the customer because you're 100% confident your feature's gonna work? Nobody raised their hand. I didn't either, right? This used to be me for the demo. Uh, when I'd run a project, it got worse when I ran a project um, because now it wasn't just my code, it was at my whole team's code. Um, and, and, and the control freak in me said, well, I don't know that their code works and so I'm gonna just, I'm going to run the demo and I'm going to hope and pray that everything works all right because that's all I can do, right? And it's one of those things where we're writing software and if you have a two-week sprint, the first like eight days of the sprint, you don't really have any concern over the demo. Like you're just coding, you're happy, you're, you're, doing, you're doing your thing and then the last day you get ready for the demo and, and you have some confidence. And even if you tested the demo and you, you wrote out the script of what you were going to do and here's the customer I'm going to use and all this kind of stuff, you go to the demo and you still feel like this. Like, I don't even want to look at the customer. I don't want to look at the website. I'm going to sit in the, sit in the back and stare at my phone while the person's running the demo so that they don't call on me, right? Um, so it's another one of those things um, where there has to be a better way of eating Cheetos, I guess. Um, yeah. 
That's your Friday night? So apparently then, I don't know where this came from, but apparently there's an infomercial that'll help you if that's your Friday night. Um, you, could, you could, what I have seen, is you can put on a hoodie backwards and then the hood becomes a bowl. Um, I've seen that. that might work. You might try that tonight. That might be uh, something. Um, all right, so how this helps, how TDD helps, is that my test suites now run thousands of times per sprint. Um, because the, especially on, um, so I'm, I'm one of like, I'm on a 30 person team. I'm one of maybe three people that's actually doing TDD. Now I'm not the only person writing tests. Um, everyone is writing tests. Most of them are writing them afterwards. Um, I'm the only one, or I'm one of a few people writing um, TDD tests though. But even still, with 30 people, that number is probably closer to 10,000 times. Because we have it as part of our build process on your local machine. When you do uh, NPM run, it also runs your tests and it watches them. And when you make a change, it runs them again. And so you have 30 people doing this constantly. And then you push a uh, story up to the, the, the source control and, and the, the CI server watches and it grabs the code and runs it. And you have that happen, um, I don't know, a few hundred times a, a, a sprint where we're getting new builds. Um, and so we're, we're having our test suite run a thousands or thousands of times per sprint. And so it's not a guarantee that the demo is going to be perfect. We, everyone that was in the, in the keynote yesterday saw Jay Harris's um, thing happen with the screen. Jay Harris has given like countless number of conference talks. Like he's not a newbie. He knows how to, how to do this and something still happened, right? And so it's kind of that way with the demo. There's still things that could blow up. But what you'll know is the things that are tested aren't going to blow up. And so you have this confidence that it might be wrong. It might be, what, it might be the opposite of what the user ultimately wanted, but it's going to be what they asked for. Right? And so that's at least better than it blowing up because you can go, oh, okay, that's not what you want. Well, let's make a change. But if it blows up, then they're like, well, that's not what I want and I don't have confidence in you that it, does, that it even works when you, when, I do give you, when you do give me what, you, what I want. So the test suite running a few thousand times per sprint um, becomes a confidence booster. Second of all, not knowing that the code works. And so I, I have, um, when you think about, when you're not doing testing, how do you know, especially in a case where I was a team lead, so if you're ever running a project or you're the one that's ever responsible for the demo, you have a few ways of knowing how the code actually works. You can, you can trust your teammates, and I trust my teammates. Even if they were in the room, I would still tell them I trust them. Um, you can assume that they're doing the right thing, but ultimately that's very exhausting, right? Because the, the only real way to know is for you to go test every single feature and every single combination of every single feature. Uh, and that's the only way for you to know with certainty that the demo is going to work, or that the code is going to work, or that this feature is going to work, right? And that's, that, that just is, that's not something I'm interested in. Like, as much as I trust my teammates, as much as I like them, as much as I think we hire smart people at Aperture, like, um, that's just too exhausting for me. I don't have enough time to go test your features. I want you to test your features. I want you to be in charge of your features. And, and so what, what happens is then I get into these confidence-robbing bugs because maybe I make that assumption. Like I've worked with you for five years and you seem like a smart person. We have good technical conversations and so I assume your code's going to work and then I pull down your feature to, to use it in my feature. Or I show it to a client or I show it to our boss and something blows up. And now we're back to square one, right? Or maybe not square one, but maybe we take a couple years off of our relationship and I'm like, ah, oh, maybe I don't trust this person as much. Or maybe it's me and you're like, yeah, I don't trust Nate as much now that he's had that bug. Um, and so there's got to be a better way um, of typing on an iPad on a knee. I don't know. I don't know why that's a problem. But your test suite gives you confidence. Much like it, the fact that it's running a few thousand times a sprint, like you can go run the test suite. So in our PR process, our, our pull request process, what we'll do is we'll identify a primary person. And so I'll put up a, a PR, or I'll, let's go the other way. Someone will put up a PR and they'll say, Nate, we want you to be the primary reviewer on this. So what that means is anyone else on the team, any of the other 29 people can go review it and they can leave comments all they want. My job is to pull the code down and to test the feature in the browser. But my job is also to pull the code down and run the tests. And my job is also to pull the code down and run, the, run through the linter. We're writing an Angular application. So run through the linter and make sure that you've done everything. And so if I pull down your code and all the tests pass, by the time I actually get to the browser, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that your feature works. Um, when I don't have the test, what often happens, and, and maybe this is just me being a jerk, if I don't have the test or your tests don't work, by the time I get to the browser, I'm thinking, I bet this thing doesn't work. I bet you I find some bugs. Right? So it's a whole different shift of dynamic of how I'm looking at your feature and how I'm working with you because now I know you have a test suite that works and I might still find some bugs, but they're not going to be major bugs most likely and they're probably going to be things that you just forgot about and that's okay. Uh, and so it, it removes um, that confidence robbing bug aspect. Uh, also, not knowing how the code works. So if you were in my debugging, I had a, a debugging talk yesterday, I had a similar meme here, right? This still makes me laugh. I still don't 
like that it makes me laugh because I don't think as software developers that we should have this attitude. But my code doesn't work. I have no idea why my code works. I have no idea why. Right? And that happens way too often for us. Um, and so you start thinking, okay, we're professionals, right? We want to sell ourselves as professionals on the level of doctors and lawyers and accountants. Um, and uh, I would not hire this contractor. If I saw him come in, I would be like, nope, never mind, we're good. I'll replace the windows myself, right? So how does, how does having TDD help? Well, tests provide the specification for what the code does. As you write more and more tests, you build up this bigger test suite. Now when I go on a new project, the first thing I do is I pull it down and I look for tests. And if I'm lucky and there's tests, then I go read the test before I ever even run the code. Because now I can see not what does the BA think the application does, but what does the test think the application does, because the test is going to tell me what the application really does. So the BA might think, oh, we log in and we give you four tries, but if I read the test and I see we actually give you seven, then I know that there's actually, that's what's actually happening, right? So the tests provide that nice uh, specification of what the code does. So the, the, the fourth, and I think it's the final uh, thing in confidence, is the solution to everything is to rebuild. I don't know if any of you are like this. I've worked with some people that, I worked with one guy that he worked on the program, re, rewrote it. He was on the team that they hired to rewrite the application. I started a year and a half later, a, a half a year later after that. So two years after the thing was rewritten, he was petitioning our boss to rewrite it again because he didn't like the patterns that we were using, right? And this is a multi-million dollar public facing application that impacts thousands of users. Like we're not going to just rewrite the thing, right? Like this is a this is a source of revenue. We're finally making money on it again after the rewrite. Let's not repeat that process, right? It's kind of like this. If you want a new carpet and you're like, "Yep, let's start over," <laughs> right? <laughs> this is my favorite one because the stormtrooper can't even hit the dryer, um, <laughs> uh, or the washer, I guess it is. So how does TDD help here? Well, constant refactoring is going to lead to cleaner code. I have much, much, much less of an impulse to rewrite my code these days because I'm constantly rewriting it. Every five minutes, I'm getting a chance to make a better variable name, a better function name, a better class name. Every few minutes, I'm getting a chance to have better functions, smaller functions, better classes, better modules. And I'm getting it while I'm testing. So I'm progressing, I'm moving my code forward, and at the same time, I'm getting cleaner code. So there's, there's never a time in my development life cycle where I draw a line in the sand and go, okay, now I'm going to go back and refactor that. Now I'm going to go back and rewrite that module because I get to do it constantly. There's also, though, that test coverage makes it easier to relate, replace parts of the application. So if we go back to the, um, the salesman score project, right? If they came back and they're like, oh, we came up with a new calculation for how we rate people on a quarterly basis, like, great, let's just yank out that whole thing and, and we'll put the new thing in and we'll be able to replace it. Or maybe you're going to go a whole other way and you're going to say, well, we were using library A to accomplish this thing and now we're going to use library B. Your test should help you see that when, when you get library B to work in parity with library A, and that is B is doing everything that you had A doing, because your test will pass again, right? Especially if you write them in a way that isn't specific to the internals of A, which would be a whole other talk on how to accomplish that. But that, that is a benefit that as you do TDD more, you get to see some of these things. So let's, let's, let's talk about the, the TLDR. Despite the, the humorous animated GIFs, some of you tuned out today, and that's fine. It's 8 in the morning. It's on the second day of a conference. Um, I was telling the people early, I almost uh, overslept the conference myself, so I get it. Uh, let's, let's, let's sum up. There's three areas that TDD improved my quality of life. First of all, it made my code better. I was no longer playing the Looney Tunes game or the mole whacking game where I'd fix a bug and another one would pop up. It get, helped me be productive. I was no longer Oscar the Grouch. I don't come home from work grouchy anymore. Um, and in fact, I have reached uh, three and a half years at this employer, a little bit more than three and a half years. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed was that's usually the time that I got the, the itch to move at a lot of places. Um, but I don't. Like, I, I, am, I am in love with where I'm working. And, and I think some of it is because I'm doing test-driven development and I get to do these kind of things that make my life happy and I get to focus on the problem I'm solving and not the line of code that I'm writing. And that makes me a little bit happier uh, in my life. Uh, the third, I get some more confidence. I know that if I want to replace parts of the application or if I want to um, make some changes, I can do that. And I know that when I go and do a customer demo, uh, that, that it's probably going to work. And, and when I say probably, that's, that's like high praise for me. Like I'm a very uh, engineering kind of person in which I'm not going to say there's any certainty that something's going to work, right? So it's going to probably work. And that gives me way more confidence than, uh, eh, I don't know, right? And that's how the, that's how the demos used to go. Now, uh, one thing, one anecdote, and I don't, I, I share this, um, uh, humorously and not prescriptively, so it's, it's a descriptive thing. Uh, we had a customer when we were doing TDD and we had the whole pipeline set up 
Uh, we had, we had um, you know, if, if the test failed, the build wouldn't uh, succeed, and the build wouldn't succeed, it wouldn't deploy, and all this kind of stuff. And we were doing this demo uh, for this customer who was super, like, connected with us. They got us. They were happy. They liked what we were doing. Like, we were just, like, lost souls connecting together, right? Or, or uh, yeah, soul, soulmates connecting together. And so we're sitting at our demo table, and he's, he's driving, because we're getting close to the, the final part of the product, and he's driving. Oh, I wish that button was over there. Or I wish I wish when I click this, it, it put up an "Are you sure?" box. And so I'm sitting there and I'm writing the tests and I'm actually like deploying things while he's doing the demo, which I, I don't recommend except for in this case when he knew how we operated. And so it was funny because I was doing this knowing that it would work because my tests would catch anything that would break. And and he's there and he clicks and he comes back and he's like, "Oh, I thought when I clicked that button, it didn't say are you sure?" And I said, "Oh, it, it didn't, but it does now." because I was able to do that with the test. I was able to have that confidence with that demo. It was kind of funny because the other developers saw the little Toastnop notifications popping up over here on the right uh, from the build server saying like, oh yep, it passed, it's deploying, it's passed, it's deploying. The, the customer never even saw it. But it was, I had that much confidence in our build system, in our test that, for that project, that I didn't have that worry of like, what, what happens if I push this? The other thing I want to make sure we know is that this is a skill. It takes time. Uh, I know some of the people here, there's, uh, there's a lot of people from, from Code Louisville, which is awesome. You guys are, are starting your journeys. There's some of us here that have been doing this a, a little bit longer. Uh, and what you'll find is that you didn't pick up coding um, in a day, right? And, and the thing I love about talking to the folks from Code Louisville is that even at the end of 12 weeks, and, and, and what's the other one, uh, Software Guild, the people I talked to from there, like even at the end of 12 weeks, they know that they, didn't, they don't know everything, right? I've talked to people from other boot camps and, and code schools, not in Louisville, and they're like, oh yeah, I'm ready to go. Like, no, you're not. Like, because here's here's like you, here's what you know, and they think they know a lot more. And so, one of the things that you guys have awesome in this community is like you guys realize I'm I'm starting my journey. Um, and so, starting your journey in C sharp or just JavaScript or Elixir or Ruby or anything else, it takes time, right? You didn't write code perfect the first time. You're not going to write your test perfect the first time. You're going to suck, and that's okay. I sucked for years as test driven development, and and I just kept working on it and kept getting better, and I started seeing these benefits more. And so, that's okay. So one of the questions I always get is, how do I convince my boss to let me do TDD? And my answer to this, um, bosses, it's, it's, a, it's a BuzzFeed title, bosses don't like me. I tell you, you don't convince your boss. I don't ask my boss for permission to do dependency injection. I don't ask my boss for permission to write a new constructor, a new function, a new class. I don't ask my boss for any questions at all related to code. And it's not because I've been doing this for 17 years. I've never gone to my boss and said, hey, can I write this function? They don't care. They're asking, are you delivering the feature, right? And so if I'm delivering the feature, they don't ask what I'm doing. And so when I'm writing my test-driven code, my boss knows that I'm the most vocal TDD person at our company. It's a, it's a point of almost a, a joke with people now. When like, we interview people and I'm in there, they're like, well, no one does TDD more than Nate. You know, that's what they'll tell the interviewee. Um, so my boss knows I do, I do TDD, and he's okay with it because I deliver my features. And, and as long as you're doing that, that's how you're going to convince your boss. Because they're going to go, man, how did you get your feature out and not have any bugs? And you go, oh, I did TDD. And they're like, oh, well, we don't pay for tests. Yeah, but I got it done in the same amount of time as my coworker, and they had five bugs. Oh, that's a good point. Why don't you just keep doing what you're doing, right? Like, that's, that's how I tell people to convince your boss. So what's next? How do I start? Well, I always tell people to start on your next bug. Um, it's it's going to be a long process. Um, if this room is, is, is all, of, all of history, and your application is right here, and from here back doesn't have tests, right? It's, it's a legacy application, no tests. And you write one test, and so you're right here, you have this much test coverage. But you keep writing tests for your bugs, eventually you'll get to the back of the wall, and you'll realize that you have way more test coverage than you don't. Right? So the goal is not Monday morning to go back and have 100% test coverage. I actually, I never shoot for 100% test coverage. That's a whole other talk as well. But the goal isn't to get that by Monday morning. The goal is to make your product better Monday morning. So that's write, a, write your next bug with TDD. Start your next feature with TDD. Start making little improvements like that. Also, um, go to this, uh, you can go to Kata's, that's word with a zero, word.it slash in. That's a, a, a link shortener. It'll take you to a, a site that has a bunch of coding katas. Coding katas are, are simple, not simple, uh, well-defined problems. Um, if you were in my debugging talk yesterday, we did a Roman numeral kata in which you use Roman numerals to calculate um, numbers. And, and so those will let you practice TDD uh, using katas in that way. Um, so all that is to say thank you. Uh, my contact information is here. Lee's already coming in for the next talk, so we don't have time to ask questions, but I'll be in the hall. If you want to grab me, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, so I want to say thank you guys for your time.